Welcome to my airplane design tutorial number one. Hi, I'm Sonja Englert. I'm an aeronautical engineer and test pilot with a passion for designing, building and flying small airplanes. You can see me here doing what I like best, which is flying my motor glider. I designed and built it, but this is only one of the projects I have worked on over the years. I want to share here some of what I have learned about airplane design. This tutorial video is going to be a bit of an introduction, starting with an overview of the overall design process, followed by more detail on the individual steps. So let's look at how to start with the design of an airplane. First of all, you need to be sure about the mission this airplane is intended for. Is it going to be a simple light single-seater, or is it going to be used to haul a lot of people or freight around? Does it need to be a fast cross-country machine or something that's used for an hour or two at, at a time in the local area? Does it need to be able to take off from a short grass strip or will it be operated from long paved runways? Once the mission of the airplane is defined, write down your personal preferences for the design such as low wing or high wing nose wheel or tail wheel or both, canopy or doors and such details. Other design considerations are for example the gross weight, which may be limited by the category the airplane is intended for, like LSA, or there may be a limit to how high the stall speed can be. The wingspan will be limited by what kind of a hangar the airplane should fit into. Once you have decided on the main requirements, it's time to decide how the airplane should look like to meet those requirements. It helps if you compare your preliminary design with existing airplanes that have a similar mission, for example by looking at engine power. While it is possible to fly a light, low-drag single-seater on 30 horsepower, it's best to plan on having a bit more available. 40 to 50 is a good number for a single-seater. Our two-seaters need at least 70 to 100 horsepower for adequate performance. Obviously, there's a lot of room to increase that number upwards for higher performance. But whatever you choose, the rest of the airplane has to be designed to match it. I like to use a simple spreadsheet to define the initial design. It includes information about the number of seats, engine power, projected empty weight and gross weight, wingspan and area, fuel capacity and projected cruise speed, the expected maximum lift coefficients and a few other details such as wing location, plan form, flaps and gear arrangement. The fields for data input, as you can see here, are the yellow ones. The pale yellow fields are for additional information but are not used for the analysis. I have included two data columns so that the the data is also shown in metric units. A little red flag at the upper right corner of a cell means that there is a comment. With this input data, I calculate the useful load, range, stall speeds, wing loading, power loading, expected takeoff roll and climb performance. Having such a table is also very useful for comparing your design with existing similar airplanes using published data. This is a valuable cross-check so that you are not planning to design something that is impossible. For example, an airplane that can carry 800 pounds, take off in 200 feet and cruise at 220 knots for 7 hours on 80 horsepower. It also lets you change the input data and see how it affects the performance. Of course, this is very preliminary, but it is a start. If you are interested in using this spreadsheet, email me and I will send it to you for free. You can find my current contact information on my website. At this point, you don't even need to know what the airplane looks like. That's next. The most important component of an airplane besides the fuselage where the occupants are housed is its wing. Without a wing, it would not be able to fly any further than this car. As per our initial design table, we need to decide on a wingspan and area. The wing area is basically what you see outlined in green here. The wingspan definition is shown here. It is pretty obvious on a high wing airplane, but what a low 
What about a low wing airplane? The wings are left and right of the fuselage, but the area that is counted as wing area for the design purpose actually includes the rectangular part that the fuselage covers. The reason is that the lift is not just created by the wings, but in small part also by the fuselage. The only exception is if there was a gap between the left and the right wing without a portion of the fuselage to close it, so the open area could not be counted as part of the wing area. First I want to introduce the definitions that are used to calculate a few things. A wing station is the distance from the airplane center line to a point outboard on the wing. In this case, wing station 1 is where the rectangular part of the wing ends. Wing station 2 is at the wing tip. The wing cord is the distance from the leading edge to the trailing edge of the airfoil. The wing cord C1, which is the same here at wing station 1, and the wing root is also used as C0 at the center line. The easiest case for calculating the wing area is obviously a rectangular wing, where the cord is constant and the cord times the wing span is the wing area. If sections of the wing are tapered, we calculate the area for each panel separately. So for the tapered panel 1, we just use the mean cord times the panel span. The full wing area is therefore the sum of all the areas of all the separate panels. If the wing is symmetric left and right, we just add the panel areas on one side and multiply it by 2. In this way, we can calculate the wing area even if the plan form shows multiple tapers. This chart shows stall speeds. The wing area is usually selected to get a certain stall speed, and I made this chart to illustrate this. Basically, the larger the wing area is, the slower is the stall speed. This relationship is pretty straightforward. If everything else remains the same, the stall speed is only a function of the wing area, as it is shown in this chart. Of course, there are some other factors, but their influence is fairly small, and to keep it simple, I'm going to neglect them here. The stall speeds were calculated for the worst case, which is at the highest weight. If the weight is lower, the stall speeds are lower as well. I assume this airplane has flaps with three settings, up, takeoff and landing. As you can see, the flaps can lower the stall speed quite a bit if their design is suitable for increasing li the lift as in this example. The corresponding flap deflections would be around 15 to 20 degrees for the takeoff position and 35 to 40 degrees for the landing position. If we need the stall speed with the flaps up to be, to be 45 knots, we can look up on this chart that we would need a wing area of about 160 square feet. Anything smaller would be unrealistic. If we could accept a stall speed of 40 knots with the flaps in the landing position and a stall speed of 42 knots flaps up, we could reduce the wing area to 120 square feet. The stall speed is calculated in my airplane initial design table. To calculate the stall speed, we need the maximum lift coefficient of the airplane which is close to the airfoil maximum lift coefficient. For my table, I ended what is commonly achievable for good airfoils, so until we get into more details on this later, do not change these numbers. So why is the stall speed or wing area important? Think about weight. A smaller wing is likely lighter because the area that is not there does not weigh anything but a higher stall speed means that the takeoff and landing distances will increase. Check the results against what runway length the airplane will have to handle. A higher stall speed also means that the chance to survive a crash in unsuitable terrain is reduced. That's it for today for the first video. In the next one, I will continue with the wing design explanations and look at initial performance data.